I thank you, Jesus. You made a way on the cross, and I thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus.
Yes, you are. I thank you, Father. You're our strength. Hallelujah. We will mount up with wings as eagles. We will run and not grow weary. We will walk and not faint because you are our strength, oh God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You keep us from fainting, Lord. You keep us from fainting in our mind. You keep us from fainting in our bodies. I thank you, Jesus. Lord, let us keep our eyes on you, fixed on you, Lord. Because you are our shield, you are our help, you are our portion, our strength, our refuge. You are everything, oh God. And I thank you, Jesus, you have never let us down, you've never failed us, you've never forsaken us, you've always kept us. There have been times when you've carried us through because we could not carry ourselves. And I thank you, Jesus, you brought us through, you brought us through, hallelujah. I thank you, God. I thank you, God, that there were fires, but we weren't burned. I thank you that there was waters, Lord God, but we didn't drown because it was you, Lord God, taking care of us, holding us. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord. You're such a good, good father, a good, good father, and you love us. You love us so passionately. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord God, for being our healer, our provider, our strength, our source. I thank you, God, that you help us to stay focused on you. Lord, that we look only to you, the way, the truth, and the life. I thank you. We look only unto you, the author and the finisher of our faith. We look to you, nothing else, no one else, only you. I thank you, Father God. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Father God, that every person in here tonight, God, Lord, I declare that they be quickened in their bodies, quickened in their minds, quickened in their spirits, Lord, by your word, by your presence. In the name of Jesus, they will not leave. We will not leave the way we came in Jesus' name. But I thank you, Father God, we leave better. We leave better in the name of Jesus. We thank you, God, for your blessing and favor over our lives and over this house. In Jesus' name. And together we said, Amen. Amen. I bless you in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Oh, thank God you, is good. I think we could probably take all evening and let everybody in here. If we let everybody just say some of the some of the things the Lord has delivered us out of. Wow. Awesome. All right. We wait on the board. There we go. Mark your calendar. Every Tuesday night is prayer night. I think Pastor said there were nine here last night. Praise God. Oh, I'm telling you. Prayer makes a difference. Oh, back it up. Every Tuesday night. All right. September 25th, ushers and greeters training at 6 p.m. All right, the October calendar, October the 1st, ladies' night at 6 p.m. Come on, ladies, bring, bring some kind of snack to share with everybody, and we're going to have movie night. We're going to share a little bit, and we're going to watch a good godly movie and just have some fun together as ladies. Amen. October 9th, media training and cleaning teams meet with Pastor October 22nd, Church Work Day, and October 29th through 31st is our Feast of Tabernacles, our conference for 2016. I'm expecting a great conference. Every year they're better and better, and you think, how can it get better sometimes? But I believe we're going to see the best yet. We're going to see the Lord manifest in great and mighty ways in our midst, in this place. Hallelujah. So I'm excited. All right, it's shoebox season is here. You know, we start collecting. The youth collects for the shoeboxes, and their goal is 30 shoeboxes this year. So if you've got little stuff to go in shoeboxes, you'd be surprised 
you know, we all got that junk drawer that we count as junk, but some of that stuff is very useful for these things because these, these that don't have people that don't have anything. So, little toothpaste, toothbrushes. Um, can't send liquid things, but you can, you know, you can send the solid bars of soap. Things that we take for granted that are so easy to come by and, and a lot of these countries are not. Um, so, anyway, as you're out doing your grocery shopping, grab a little something. And when you come in, throw it in the, in the basket that she, I'm sure Chris is going to put out there for our shoe boxes. All right. Glenn and Pam Hunter and their family are our focus family this week. We're praying for their comfort and, and the loss of Glenn's brother, for their strength as they take care of Pam's mother, and uh, for the Lord to bless them and, and restore them and refire them and strengthen them and do good to them. Pray for them like you would pray for you. Amen. All right, stand up with me. Praise God. Let's declare. We are a family church, a Bible training center. We're changing Lancaster, South Carolina, and we're excited about Jesus. Yes, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our vision is Jesus Christ. Our mission is to preach, teach, and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in all the fullness of his glory and power and to radiate his love to our community and to all the world. Amen. Amen. I believe that when we say it, we mean it, we declare it, and our words, you know, they go forth to bring it to pass. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, take your tithes, offerings in your arms, in your hands. Let's hold it up to the Lord. Thank the Lord for his provision. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you provide all good things, and we thank you that you give seed to the sower. We thank you, Lord, for your provision. We thank you for your increase. We thank you, Father, that you take what we have, and like the widow woman that had just a little bit, you increase it, and you make it go way further than it would normally go. Thank you, Father. We receive your increase for Open Door Fellowship and for every family connected with Open Door. We thank you, Father, for blessing and favor in all the earth. We thank you, Father, that you use this, that your gospel go forth. This wonderful gospel message that we have in this house goes forth and does great things, makes a difference in the earth to your glory. In Jesus' name, we say together, amen. Love on somebody as you sow.
back to your seat. Remain standing with me, and we're running just a little bit late tonight, but God is good, and there's a wonderful presence of the Lord in the atmosphere, and I pray that you are walking in the presence of God the way you should in consciousness that he is here to help you and bless you. God is good. God's good. And he's blessing and ministering to us. So let's agree together. Father, thank you now. Your word, this new covenant, soaked in Jesus' blood, sealed by the power and authority of your spirit, your very breath, your very heart from the foundation of the world, coming through a lamb slain to redeem us, to heal us, bless us, bring us into your heart where you wanted us to be all along. So we agree with you tonight. Set ourselves in agreement to agree with your word, to agree with your spirit, and to believe. Quicken our faith. And I thank you, Lord. As I preach tonight, help me love the people. Increase in love toward them, even as you love me. Help me to love them and bless them. And not be interested in just preaching, but loving and giving and serving and ministering. I thank you, Lord. My lips are threads of scarlet. My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. My voice is a sounding trumpet. And I pray for the eyes, the ears, the heart of the people that they are ready to receive. Just amazing, ready to hear what they have not heard, see what they have not seen, and walk in the reality and the truth of what you've done in them and for them. I thank you for it. Good seed on good ground to your glory. And in Jesus' name, we all said together, amen. All right, children, young people, you may go. And if you're in the auditorium, let's go back to Romans chapter 8, verse 26 through 28. And I appreciate you taking your time being here in our Wednesday Bible study and the blessing and favor of the Lord make you rich tonight, increase you. And as you're sowing your time and investing your talents and treasures in the house of the Lord, may you be richly blessed. He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 3, seeing you look for these things, be diligent. You know, that's a word that's missing in a lot of places. Be diligent about these things. And diligence means to give your heart, mind, thought, and attention to, to pay attention, to, to consume or go after or to follow after or to pursue. So I'm just encouraging you tonight to be in the name of Jesus, diligent in the word with me, and let's go further. Now we're in the uh, opportunity here to look into the eighth day, life in the spirit, Life and the flow of the anointing where God has us living now. And let's read Romans chapter 8. Let's read verse 26 through 28 for time's sake tonight. Likewise, the Spirit, in the same wisdom that we are in patience, waiting for God, transitioning our body, in like manner, this same patience works in the Spirit. He helps our infirmities, which means He takes hold with us against the weakness and frailties of our life, no matter what those infirmities are. And we shout tonight, Jesus bore our infirmities, Matthew 8, verse 17. And then he tells you what the greatest infirmity of the church is. We know not what we should pray for as we ought. And if we don't know what to pray for, it hinders us from knowing how to pray, and it puts us in great difficulty. Well, the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered, which means they're deeper and they're higher and wider than what we can articulate ourselves. So he's taking you into the baptism of the Holy Ghost here. And he that searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. It's a very powerful. This intercession that comes through the Spirit is according to the will of God. And once the will of God is prayed in the Spirit, through the Spirit, by the Spirit, and we know. Now I want you to notice in verse 26, we know not... In verse 28, we know. This is the governing aspect of the Holy Ghost in the journey. The Holy Ghost has two primary responsibilities. One is to glorify Jesus and introduce you to Jesus, bring you to Jesus, to show you Jesus, to teach you Jesus, to unveil Jesus, to bless Jesus and show you how big Jesus is. That's his ministry. That's what he came to do is to glorify Jesus. He shall take what is mine, show it unto you. Jesus said in John 16, Verse 13 through 15, he shall glorify me. Smith Wigglesworth said, when you get the Holy Ghost, you get a bigger Jesus. I like that. When you get the Holy Ghost, you get a bigger Jesus. So he's here to reveal and unveil Jesus to me, just as in Genesis 24, Eleazar, the servant of Abraham, on the journey back, he began to introduce Rebekah to Isaac, although she'd never seen him face to face. He began to introduce her. And so when she saw him in the field, the Bible said in Genesis 24, she lit off the camel, veiled her face, and ran to meet him. And I believe that's the reality of what God will do for us. If we will just listen to the Spirit of God, he will help us fall hopelessly in love with Jesus. 
We are the bride of his promise. He is the groom of our promise. And everything depends on him. And the Holy Ghost is here to glorify Jesus. Thank God for that. But he's also here to govern the journey. It was his responsibility to get Rebecca to Isaac. It was his responsibility to make sure that they were governed. He guarded them. He guided them. He grounded them. He led them. He took them. He ministered to them. So we are to be led by the Spirit. We are to be fed by the Spirit. It's his responsibility. I am the responsibility of the Holy Spirit. He's been sent. So I've often used this illustration. You know, if you have a long journey to take, and someone offers you a map and you say, I'll be fine. Well, you know, you can get lost as can be with a map. Now, it's a little bit different in our day because the GPS is not so easy to get lost. Although I have known people to get lost with a GPS, not impossible. But when you have one of them old road maps and you're looking at it and you're driving and you come up on Atlanta, Georgia, and you're looking at a road map, I promise you, when you get down to those six interchanges and the lanes go six ways and there's three overpasses and you're going 65 mile an hour and everybody else is doing 75, that don't look like no map. And ain't nobody got any mercy for you because you got a South Carolina tag and you in Georgia. And they will beep and honk and push and they will absolutely try to drive you off the road. There's no mercy there. See, they're used to that. But when you're looking at a map, that don't look the same and you can get really lost with a map. But if you have a map which is your Bible, and then you have a guide. And somebody said, well, I'm going to sit in the front seat. I've taken this journey a thousand times. I could do it blindfolded. I know every turn. I know every place we need to stop. I've got this. All you need to do is pay attention and listen and do what I tell you, and we'll get there safe and sound, and we'll have a prosperous journey. And we will certainly go by the map, but we will learn how to interpret the map in application. Now, here's what I did I got my Bible, and because I was so gun-ho for my Bible, I took off. I left the Holy Spirit, and I ended up in a ditch. And I looked up, and there he was, precious Holy Spirit. Would you like some help? Yeah. he get me out of the ditch. Would you want me to help you? Oh, I got it. I got my Bible. And I'd take my Bible, and I would go. And I did that for many years of going to certain intervals, and then I'd find myself in the ditch on the left or the right. I'd get in a new teaching. I'd get over here in the ditch. I'd get in another teaching. I'd get in the ditch every time. Holy Spirit, so faithful, so good. I'd look up, there he'd be, till finally one day, he said to me, you know, John, I've never lost anyone on this journey. I'll take the journey with you and you never need be lost or get in the ditch again. And I said, all right, Holy Spirit, you become my partner. Let's be partners together. There's no need for you to get in a ditch when you have the word and the spirit. Now, there's some people that want to lay down the word and just go by the spirit. They always get in a ditch too. Because the Spirit of God will never lead you and guide you outside the Word. They work together. So as one old preacher said, if you have the Word only, you're going to dry up. If you have the Spirit only, you'll blow up. But if you get the Word and Spirit, you'll grow up. You'll grow up. And that's what God's after. So the Holy Ghost has come to govern my journey. So likewise, the Spirit helps our infirmities. Likewise, the Spirit comes hold to take hold with me against my infirmity. And I move from not knowing to knowing. That's government. That's how God teaches us, trains us, so that I'm living in a steadfast, unwavering, full assurance of faith, what the Bible calls the riches of assurance to full understanding, what the Bible calls a steadfast confidence, what the Bible calls an unshakable faith. I'm living there, and we know. When the Spirit of God prays in us and through us, we come to this place of knowing that all things are working for my good. Now, it may not look like it. Circumstances may appear to be very contradictory to what I'm walking in and what the Bible said, but the Holy Ghost is confirming in me that everything's working for my good. I don't need to be afraid. I don't need to be worried. Everything's working for my good. He's working this out. Something's at work within me and behind the scenes, he's bringing forth his glory in my life. And it's impossible to fail if we just listen. Then he said, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose, which is the table of showbread. And he's going to reveal the bread here. And he's going to show you what you're really called to and what you're supposed to walk in. You're the seed of Abraham to walk in victory. And the serpent and the scorpion are under your feet tonight. Jesus said, I give you power to tread on serpent scorpions over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Now we're looking at this and we've looked at two thoughts here in this part of the revelation of the spirit. Number one, the indwelling spirit. Thank God he lives in me tonight. Know you not you are the temple and the spirit you have is of God. He lives in you tonight. 
He dwells in you. You're bought with a price. Glorify God in your spirit and in your body, which are God's. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, Jesus said, John 14, 17, the world cannot receive the spirit, but you can because you've been born again. And before they can receive the spirit, they need to get born again. But Jesus said, the spirit of truth is with you and he will be in you. And Jesus said, I and my Father will come, manifest ourselves to you. We will make our abode with you. And Jesus said, John 17, 23 and 26, I in them, Father, I in them. What glory. Galatians 2, 20, Christ in me. It's God who works in you to will and do his good pleasure. You have the spirit of God in you. Eternal resources, eternal power, eternal glory, never weakens, never tires. He lives in you. God Almighty lives in you. You're the temple of Almighty God. Whoever shall confess Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him. And he dwells in God, 1 John 4, verse 15. You dwell in God tonight, God dwells in you. Mighty, the indwelling of the Spirit. Likewise, the Spirit. So how's he going to help you? From the inside out. He's going to work from the inside out. So let's prophesy tonight. It's God working in me to will and do his good pleasure. He who began this good work will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Although I'm complete in Christ, yet he's working to bring my experience to the reality of what's already true of me in his mind and thought. I am complete, yet he's working to bring me to experiential completeness and fullness and overflowing. Thank God he's working in me. So the indwelling of the Spirit. Then the last time we were together, I showed you the infirmity of the saints, and we talked about the infirmity of prayer, how many people get bogged down and struggle in the arena of prayer. And Jesus bore all of our infirmity, and he certainly bore the infirmity of prayer. Jesus was forsaken at the ninth hour, the ninth hour is the hour of prayer, Acts 3, 1. So Jesus was forsaken in the moment of prayer, in the hour of prayer, so I'd never be forsaken. You see, the cries of a righteous man from the cross were not heard because he was identified with my unrighteousness. So that the cries of an unrighteous man identified with his righteousness will be heard now. And I can say, whatever I ask the Father in my name, he'll give it to me. Jesus said, whatsoever thing you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, you shall have them. And we closed last time by looking at this reality that earnest prayer, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man is for us to learn to prophesy concerning the word of the Lord because we are confident in his righteousness. And when we looked in the book of James 5, 16 through 18, we discovered something very hidden. I've never seen that before, but the reality is God called earnest prayer Elijah prophesying there would be no rain. With boldness and confidence, he just simply said, according to my word, it will not rain in the land. Not, not moved, not shaken. And to prove that, when he gave that prophecy, he came out. The brook dried up. It didn't move him. The woman with the two sticks, her lack didn't move him. The boy dying didn't move him. The prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel didn't move him. When he got down to pray, he just simply said, Lord, the God that answers by fire, you're the God, let your fire fall. 63 word prayer, fire fell, and a whole nation repented. He was unmoved when he prayed earnestly. He was unmoved after the circumstances. Now, James also said he prayed that it would rain. It didn't say he prayed earnestly that it would rain. Now, when you go, and for some reason, and the Bible's not clear why, I have my thought, but once he killed the prophets of Baal, I believe in his own heart. He knew he was going to have to deal with Jezebel. And because of that reality, when he got up on the mountain, which God had already told him in 1 Kings 18, 1, it's going to rain. See, God had already said to him, it is going to rain. And instead of the same confidence we see in 1 Kings 17, 1, when he gets at the end of chapter 18, he's up on the mountain and he puts his head between his knees. And now he says, servant, go tell me, do you see a sign? Now he needs something outward to tell him and convince him of what God said, where in chapter 17 he didn't because he prayed earnestly. Now it did rain on the earth after he prayed seven times, but the difference is when he walked out of that and he came out of that, the next day in 1 Kings 19, when Jezebel confronted him, he ran like a scalded dog. So I'm persuaded now, if I pray earnestly, when I come out of that prayer time, my circumstances won't move me. When the brook dries up, that don't move me anymore. When I'm faced with a woman with two sticks that doesn't have enough and I'm sent to her, that doesn't move me anymore. When I'm faced with a boy dying, that don't move me anymore. When I am faced with the prophets of Baal, don't move me anymore. But if I'm praying, then when I come out of that prayer time, then the spirit of Jezebel and all these other things move me. You see the difference? He was moved 
when he prayed seven times. He was moved when he had his head between his knees. He was moved when he required a sign in the heavens. When he had the word, 1 Kings 18, 1, there was a word given that said, it will rain upon the earth. All you need is God's word. If you've got the word of the Lord, you can stand and prophesy it boldly. You've got God's word. God's word is enough. It's all sufficient, all encompassing. The blood-soaked document of the new covenant should be in your mouth with utter confidence. You have the word of the Lord. And that word is prophetic, a sword in your mouth. And once you come out of that, God says earnest prayer is to lift your hands before God and say, God, before whom I stand, I thank you. Healing flows. I thank you. This turns. I thank you that boy saved. And when you pray that way, God said, that's earnest prayer. And it avails much. Now, we've all been praying for a long time with our head between our knees, looking for signs and wonders, looking for uh, outside uh, revelations of change. And we hadn't got that far. But when you pray earnestly, I've done it a few times. I've done it a few times. When you pray earnestly, then thank God you're not shaking anymore. That's how you know. When you can come out of prayer and you've prayed earnestly, it's when you prophesy based on your righteousness in Christ. And you decree it and you're convicted and convinced and that's the way it is. That's righteousness in prayer. Now, we all want to learn to operate there. We all want to learn to operate there and live there. Now, I've touched that dimension. I've never lived there, but I'm learning that's where God wants me to live. That's where God wants you to live. So God's teaching us how to overcome the infirmity of prayer, the Spirit of God working in us. Now, tonight I want to talk to you about intercession and uh, spiritual transition. And uh, I didn't realize there was so much here. I got into it early this morning. I was over here early this morning. And I got into it, and the Lord just began to expound and just began to unveil things I'd never seen before. So he gave me four thoughts, and we're only going to deal with one tonight. The first thought was this, is that we need to understand the pathway of spiritual transition. There needs to be some understanding. God never wants you to operate in confusion. God wants you to know what's coming. God wants you to be informed. God wants you to live informed. You've got inside revelation. Then number two, here there's an unction to pray in tongues. With groanings which cannot be uttered. How are those groanings going to come? They're going to come out of your heart and your mouth. The groanings of the spirit within are articulated by us. And Paul said, when a man prays in an unknown tongue, he speaks mysteries in the spirit. He speaks unto God. And he said, now in the public assembly, when we come together, if we just come together and pray in tongues, like tonight, if I chose to, I could come in here by faith. I could get up here and I can pray in tongues for 35, 40 minutes. And you just sit there and listen to me. I can do that by faith. But now you don't occupy the room of the unlearned. See, here's where people get in trouble. Paul said, he that occupies the room of the unlearned will not be able to say amen at the giving of your thanks. Now, here's my suggestion. Because I've had people come in church and say, look, that's not right. I didn't get anything out of it. If you're in the room of the unlearned, you need to come out of it. God never ordained anybody to sit in the corner with a dunce cap on. That's what the room of the unlearned is. It's the dunce cap. You come in church, I don't understand that. When I'm talking in tongues, you ain't supposed to understand it. Now, in a public assembly, if tongues take over, there should be an interpretation. And if there be no interpretation, he plainly told you, the one that gave the tongue should interpret, and if he can, he needs to be quiet. That's very clear. But you have to understand, he that occupies the room of the unlearned, are you in the room of the unlearned, then you need to learn. If you don't know something about the Holy Ghost, you can learn. He wants you to be delivered from the room of the unlearned. And when you come out of the room of the unlearned, you'll learn something. So there's an unction to pray in tongues here. And then there's an unshakable peace and truth. We move from not knowing to knowing. Unshakable. This confidence is from God. It's the anchor of the soul. It's unshakable. You become unshakable when this takes hold of your heart. And then you begin to have an unspeakable praise and thanksgiving, which will conclude that over in 1 Peter chapter 1. So there's a lot here. God began to unfold it to me this morning. There's a lot here. So let's begin tonight. Understanding the pathway of transition, we are moving in God. We're growing up into Him in all things. We're growing up into Him in all things. Now, please notice, here's God's plan. This is the way God operates His tran- what I call the transplant of God. First thing that happens when you get born again, He'll translate you out of Adam into Christ. He takes your spirit out of death and he translates you into life. 
He takes you out of darkness. Paul said you were darkness, but now are you light in the Lord, Ephesians 5, 8. You were an old creature, now you're a new creature. You were in the old covenant under the law, now you're a new creature in Christ, in him made redeemed and righteous through his blood. So he translates you. Colossians 1.12 said, giving thanks to the Father who made us able to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light, who delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us. So praise God, I'm in a new world since the Lord saved me. I'm in righteousness, I'm in peace, I'm in strength. He's taken me out of Adam and put me in Christ. Out of death and into the, into the life of God, out of darkness into light, out of unrest into rest. He's translated me. Thank God that means to completely sever and move from one place to another. He has translated me. I'm out of the kingdom of darkness. It has no place in me, no part. I'm out of it. It's out of me. Praise God. Amen. Thank God for that. Well, then number two, it doesn't know, does you no good if you, if you translate a bush from one side of your yard to the other. You've got to plant it. So then the second thing he does is transplant you. He won't just take you in Christ, then he's going to plant you in Christ. And he begins to teach you in Christ and train you in Christ. As you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him. Now there's transplanted, rooted and built up. Rooted, let your roots go deep in Christ. So let's just preach the gospel for a moment. Christ is my righteousness. Christ is my strength. Christ is my rock. Christ is my healing, Christ is my help, Christ is my hope, Christ is my deliverance, Christ is my dominion, Christ is my glory. Everything I am and have, I'm rooted in Christ. It all depends on the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, all of it. And the deeper your roots go in Christ, the higher you can be built up in Christ. See, he descended into the lower parts of the earth so that you could ascend into the higher parts of the earth. You see, he took the pit so you could receive the palace. He took death so you could receive life. And the more you let your roots and the more your confidence, your trust, the more your faith rests in the person. I trust Jesus. I trust him, the righteous man, the holy man. I trust him, his blood, his work, what he did. I trust him. Then God keeps taking. Every time you boldly admit that, agree with that, every time that you cling fast to the faith you have in Christ, then God is deepening your roots in Christ. You must be transplanted. You must be. Because if not, you'll be blown about with every wind of doctrine. There are divisive winds, deceptive winds. There are doctrinal winds. There are deceptive winds. There are destructive winds. And you're blown about with every wind of doctrine. God wants you so anchored and grounded that the winds of doctrine don't move you anymore. The next message you come to town is not going to move me. Or the one after that or the one after that. Now, when I was a young man, every new word that came to town, I jumped on that train and wrote it for a while until I realized where it was going. Did y'all do that? Do you remember that? How that used to be? I remember in the early 90s, man, I was so hungry. It was just unbelievable how hungry I was and everything that came along. Every time I heard a new television preacher, every time I heard something new, it didn't matter what it was. I just, like a hungry bass, I took it, I ate it, I fed on it. And at some point, some of that stuff will make you internally sick spiritually. At least give you spiritual indigestion. And if you stay on it long enough, you'll lose your appetite. And you know, if you went in a natural six, seven, ten days and had no appetite for food, you go get yourself checked because you know that's a sign something's not right when you have no appetite. Something's missing. Something's out of order. So you have to be transplanted. And God takes you deep, deep, deep into Christ. Deep into Christ. Christ is your life. Christ is your strength. Christ is your help. Christ, the person of Jesus, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, abounding near him with thanksgiving as you've been taught, deep in the faith. Then the third thing he begins to do is transform you by the renewing of your mind, Romans 12, 2. He'll transform you by the renewing of your mind. Now, this is where he teaches you repentance and how to lay down your thoughts and take up his. So let's quote it. Be not conformed to the world. Don't be molded and sculpted Every time I've got ready to say something about this shortage, the Lord said, don't say that. Don't agree with them. I've had 10, 15 people come up to me and say something about it. The Lord said, don't do that. I meet your need. Don't say that. Don't get involved in that conversation. You tell them I meet your need. You don't need to engage that on that level. That's not going to help. You repent of your thoughts. You see, my thoughts would be, well, there's a gas shortage. They're telling me gas may go up before it comes down. They're saying all those things. We went through this in 2008. Same old thing. 
So I'm just going to stand at the pump, believe God, gas is coming back down. I'm going to stand at the pump, believe we've got plenty of gas, and prophesy the word of the Lord, and there's no need to go down there and get involved in all that silliness and all that foolishness. Early predictors have already predicted this winter is going to be really bad for certain strands of the flu. But you know what? I'm taking my flu shot now. I'm taking communion every day. I'm getting ready. Praise God. I'm going to believe I'm healed of the flu before I get the flu. See, you don't wait till you get it and then believe you're healed of it because that's misery. It'd take a long time to do that. You believe you're healed before it ever gets here. See, that's being transformed. If you can stand around in the crowd of the world and fit in, talk like them, think like them, believe like them, you really are bad off. If the world fits you, you're the wrong size. Now, I'm sad to say, if you can get around most people and preachers in the church, and if you really let the guard down and just let people talk, if you can fit in with them, and you can flow with them, and you can track with them, then you're probably bad off too. Because most church people really are embalmed with a lot of unbelief. they still got a lot of unbelief. There's a transforming here. Transformation means radical change. If you're ever going to be supernatural, you've got to leave rational thought. Jesus is not rational. Jesus does not operate in the rationale. He doesn't do that. Jesus is a radical departure from anyone or anything or anybody I've ever met. He doesn't think like, walk like, talk like anybody else I know. And the more I listen to him, the more he imprints his image on my thought and my mind and my soul, the more people begin to think I am strange. <laughs> Krista looked at me one time and she said, I know what you're going to do. And I said, what am I going to do? And she told me, I said, yep, that's what I'm going to do. She said, it's just weird having a dad like you. It's just weird. That's not what other dads would do. I said, well, thank God I ain't other dads. And if I've got one ambition, it's not to be like other dads. If I've got an ambition, I want to be like my father. So Krista, I could say to you, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. That's the way I like to live my life. So I can smile at my daughter and say, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. I walk like father, I talk like father. You start doing that, and man, no wonder Peter says, you are a peculiar people. The world will say, that's a weirdo right there. He's a nut. That guy right there, he's a nut. Well, <laughs> they may call me a nut, but I'm a blessed nut and a heel nut, praise God. <laughs> I was talking to a man uh, at Bible school that knew the Greek very well and he was explaining to me and exegeting to me and expostulating. You know, exegesis and expostulation are words for theologians. Most people don't use those two words. And we sat down together and he began to exegete and expostulate while the healing gospel I believed was somewhat false. And in his mind, a whole lot false. And he said, so uh, Pastor John, you know, the reality of it is you're a fool for believing that. And I said, well, I'm a heel fool. I said, I lay in the bed. I know what I felt. I know what was in my body. I'm a heel fool. So if this is being a fool, then I'll be a fool for Jesus. He's got to transform you. And that means you've got to let go of your thought. And sometimes that's the scariest thing you can do because you've learned and trained yourself to think the way you think. And you were trained by your parents and trained by circumstances and trained by life and trained by your job and your income and all those things. Train you in the way you think. And God wants to undo all that. Be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. And what happens when your mind's renewed that you may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. See, that's part of God's plan is for you to lay down your thought and be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So let me say this again. Everybody in here needs a checkup from the neck up. Our thinking needs to radically shift to God's thought. Then number four, he'll make you transparent. You'll find in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 that he will cause you to be known and read of all men. God wants people to see Jesus in your life. And thus, there's this great part of the gospel, this theme of the gospel. He must increase, I must decrease. There's a removing of me and a remaining of him. You see, he's always out front. Paul said, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. My life flows out of Christ in me. So God wants people to see Jesus in you. Your living epistles known and read of all men. He'll make your life transparent so that you don't have anything to hide. Nothing to hide. 
Nothing hidden, and you can just be real, be open, be honest, be sincere, and just flow and let Jesus be seen. That should be your daily prayer. Lord, let Jesus be seen in my life today. Whoever looks into the pages of my life as you write the story, let today Jesus be seen in the pages of my life today. Let Jesus be seen. So Paul said this, you're a living epistle. Now receive that, I'm a living epistle. Known and read of all men, not written in ink, but written in the spirit of the living God. So God wants to transparent you or make you transparent so that your life's an open book and the book reads Jesus. Jesus. Light can be seen. He's the light of the world. Salt can be tasted. He's the salt. Influence can be felt. He's our influence. He's what influences us. Testimony must be heard. Well, you know, he's our testimony. My testimony is Jesus. And my witness is that I follow Jesus and Jesus lives in me. That's my witness. That's how God makes you transparent. He wants people to see Jesus in you. The greatest testimony you could ever have is just to live the gospel. One preacher said it this way, go out and preach the gospel and use words only if necessary. Now, yes, we need to engage and talk to people, but people need to see Jesus much more than they need to hear about Jesus. If they see him, then it makes it much easier to talk about him. You receive that? He makes me transparent. That's part of his plan. Then transmission because he wants to work something through you to help other people. And Philemon 1.6 said, by acknowledging every good thing that's in you in Christ, the communication of your faith becomes effectual or that you begin to have powerful faith to communicate to others. Ephesians 4.29 said that the communication of the grace of God may minister grace to the hearers. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but what is good to the use of edifying that may minister grace to the hearers. So God wants you to be able to communicate both faith and grace. So he's transmitting something through you. It's like you're a transmitter. You know, he puts you here. You're born from above. You're born in the heavens. You're put on earth and you're a transmitter. And all he needs to do is get you on the right frequency. And then he can start sending his signal through you. And his signal becomes signs and wonders and prayer and peace and the presence of God and, and rest and favor and blessing wherever you go. And it starts transmitting and you start creating an atmosphere so that what's coming out of you is bigger than anything around you. And then no matter what circumstance you find yourself in, what's transmitting through you is bigger than what you're in. It makes you bigger. He's enlarged your heart. He's enlarged your vision. He's enlarged your mind and your thought. He's enlarged you. What a blessed place to live when you walk in the hospital room and it's not the doctor's report that holds sway. It's not what the doctor says that holds sway. It's what's in you that holds sway. The doctor may have said 15 minutes to live, but you're walking in there with the resurrection in you and he's transmitting and you can walk over to the bed and say, daughter, now in Jesus' name, it's not your day to die. You'll live and not die and declare God's work to your generation. You have that authority in you. You have the power of God in you. God wants to transmit through you supernaturally so people can see demonstrations. Jesus said, and if Jesus said, and I'm in, if Jesus said, and I'm in, Jesus said, greater works than these shall you do because I go unto my Father. Jesus said that. And if Jesus said, and I'm in, if Jesus said it, I say, yes, sir, help me, tune in. He, see, he's tuning you, dialing you in so that his frequency, which is heaven, can flow through you and heaven is radically different from the earth. You remember Isaiah chapter six? Whoa, 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 boy, it parallels our day. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Talk to three people from out around the country today. What's going on in Charlotte? What's happening in Charlotte? We prophesy peace in the name of Jesus over Charlotte, North Carolina. We speak peace to that situation. Peace over the people. Peace over the family. Peace over the police officers in the name of Jesus. We preach peace. We speak peace and we prophesy peace in the name of Jesus. If you put your head over in that, it's whoa, 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 whoa. But if you put your head in the heavens, the earth is full of his glory. The earth is full of his glory. The earth is full of his glory they're crying day and night the earth is full of his glory and somebody's going to wake up somebody's going to realize that God wants you to be the prophetic conduit and the voice that prophesies glory in the earth because any old false prophet can tell you what's wrong any old false prophet can tell you what's wrong matter of fact the news can tell you what's wrong hmm. are you listening and then finally this plan, God translates you, he transplants you, he trans 
forms you. He makes you transparent. He then transmits through you. And then he's transitioning you. Romans 1.17 said from faith to faith. And 2 Corinthians 3.18 said from glory to glory. So we never stop. We're always moving from faith to faith and from glory to glory. Your faith is a fruit and fruit grows. Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, meekness, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, temperance, faith. Against these, there's no law. Faith is a fruit. The glory of God is just simply His presence, but you're always growing into and going into more of that glory. As you behold Him and see Him, more of that glory. So now you must understand this. It's not because of God. It's because of us. There are four dimensions in God. Now please learn this. The living God... The Lord, the Lord God Almighty, and Father. There's outer court, inner court, holy place, and then throne of God. There's, O oh, ye of little faith, I have faith in God. Number two, number three, I've not found so great a faith. And number four, building yourselves up in a most holy faith. There's my peace I leave with you. Then there's Great peace have they that love thy law, another dimension. And then there's peace that passes understanding. And then there's perfect peace. You see it? There's the joy of the Lord is your strength. And then there's great joy in Acts 8 when they had revival. Then when Jesus was born, there's exceeding great joy. And then Peter says there's joy unspeakable full of glory. There's God so loved the world. And then... Ephesians 2, for his great love. Then Ephesians 3, love that passes knowledge. And then 1 John 4, 18, perfect love. Perfect love. And you'll find that all over the Bible. We used to teach the kingdom a lot. I used to teach that a lot. And I'd always teach there's three stages in the kingdom, the blade, the ear, and the full corn in the ear. I forgot the most important part. You know what it was? It's the seed. No seed, no blade. No blade, no ear, no ear, no full cone in the ear. It's four. I am the way, the truth, the life. I used to say three dimensions, way, truth, life. Forgot the most important part. I am. First dimension, I am. See, without an I am, there can never be a way, truth, life. So we just look past some things and we overlook some things that we miss. I always said under preachers that told me there were three and thank God for three. There's a lot of threes in your Bible like Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Love, faith, and hope. And these abide. There are a lot of threes, but there's a lot of fours and this fourth dimension is the place God's called us to be and live. You see that? Now, I want you to go to Ezekiel chapter 47. We're going to spend the rest of our time here tonight. Ezekiel chapter 47. And that is a tremendous revelation. Most people don't know that plan, but that's God's plan. What are you doing in my life right there? I just gave it to you. So you can pray, Lord, thank you, I'm translated. Thank you that I am transplanted. Make my roots go deeper in Christ. Then pray, Lord, transform me by the renewing of my mind. Lord, make me transparent. Lord, transmit your life through me. And then, Lord, help me transition from glory to glory. Now, here's a beautiful picture of it. Let's read Ezekiel 47, 1 through 9. We'll read it, and then we'll make a few comments out of here. Afterward, he brought me again to the door of the house. And behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. For the forefront of the house stood toward the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house at the side of the altar. Verse 2. He brought me out of the way of the gate northward and led me about the way into the outer gate by the way that looks eastward, and behold, there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line, this is Jesus, had the line in his hand, went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits, that's the most holy place, and he brought me through the waters, the waters were to the ankles. And he measured a thousand and brought me through the waters and the waters were to the knees. And again, he measured a thousand and brought me through and the waters were to the loins. And afterward, he measured a thousand and it was a river that I could not pass over. The waters were risen, waters to swim in a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, son of man, have you seen this? God wants you to have vision with precision. You need to see this. Have you seen it? Can you see it tonight? He said, Son of man, have you seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the brink of the river because now you see it, you've got some choices. He took him back to the brink where this all begins. Now you've got choices. Now when I had returned, behold, the bank of the river were many trees on one side and the other. And of course, there are the trees of the Lord planting. The trees on the left side would always be the death. The trees on the right side would be the tree of life. 
The cross is the tree of death. Thank God the cross is the tree of life. You can preach that that way. You can preach it this way. Christ crucified. Crucified are the trees on the left side where the judgment is. Christ himself is the tree of life. So on either side, you know, in order for a river to flow, you've got to have banks. If you take out a bank, you get a swamp. The banks are what holds the river in tension to keep it flowing. Without banks, a river can't flow. So you have to have two sides to this. And the trees, and thank God they're trees. They're trees and they bear the fruit of the Lord. And their leaves are for the healings of the nations. Then he said unto me, These water issue out of the east country and go down to the desert, go into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the water shall be healed. In verse 9, it shall come to pass that everything that has this kind of life, this lacking life, this lower life, this carnal life, which moves wherever the rivers come, shall live or have God's own life. There shall be a great multitude of fish, Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men, because these waters shall come thither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live where the river comes. Wow, what a revelation. So let's look at this. Here's transition. So the transition begins... God brought Ezekiel back to the door. Now, I'm sad to say that in our Christianity, we left the door. Now, y'all tell me real loud who the door is. Jesus said, I am the door. Now, I got saved and fell hopelessly in love with Jesus. And then after being around preachers and people and doctrines and church, I found myself in love with Jesus and. Jesus and preaching and Jesus and pastoring and Jesus and growing the church and Jesus and learning and Jesus and growing and Jesus and revelation. And so Jesus became part of all of that mixed together. And in my experience, I left my first love. So in 1996, God started bringing me back to the door. And tonight I can, I can honestly say, I want to know Jesus and I want to make him known. That's my heart. That's my passion. That's my ambition. That's what I want. I want to know Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I want to agree with Jesus. I want to know Jesus. I mean, as hard as it's been for me, keep laying down these things. Do you want to preach conferences? I want to know Jesus. But if I know Jesus, he'll have me at every conference I need to be at. And I want to build a church. I want to grow open door. And part of me wants to grow open door really bad. But if I know Jesus, then he'll grow open door through me and build his church. It's a constant struggle for a preacher to just keep his focus on the Lord Jesus. He brought me to the door. So let me encourage you, just let Jesus be your everything. We say this all the time. He's all I need. He's all I need. Jesus, my everything. Let him be your everything. Let Jesus be everything to you. Let God bring you back to the door and show you the door. It don't matter where you go in this building, every exit and entrance is marked by a door. If you want to go out the building that way, there's a door. If you want in that closet, there's a door. Want in that closet, there's a door. You want out of the sanctuary, there's a door. You want to go in the deacon's office, there's a door. If you want to go in the bathroom, there's a door. The door always opens up to something that is needed and necessary. And the doors in this building are an enormous revelation. If you'll just see Jesus, every time you go into Jesus, another dimension, another realm, another revelation, another unfolding from faith to faith, glory to glory, it just keeps unfolding. It'll never stop. The unsearchable riches of Christ, it'll never stop. Now, the demand God puts on your faith, he just simply said here, behold. Now, God wants you to look. This is important. Distraction keeps us from believing God. Behold. All things have become new. Beholding the glory of the Lord. Looking unto Jesus, author and finisher of our faith. Peter, beholding, looking at the wind. You can't see the wind, but it got his attention because it was blowing on him. When he looked and saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. You must learn to look. The demand on your faith is behold. Your faith is going to be energized by what you look at or it's going to be demoralized by what you look at. Let me say that again. Your faith is going to be energized or demoralized based on what you look at. So God tells Ezekiel, behold, look at this, look. And then you see this wonderful picture of the death on the right side of the altar. The right side of the altar. Now, Jesus was crucified. You look at me this way. So be on the right side of the altar. His right side was pierced, right side, right hand of favor, right side of the altar. Jesus was crucified. So the waters run out. Blood and water came from his side. Waters pour out. Waters flow out. So the right side of the altar is the place where God made things right. Jesus said, cast your net on the right side because if you keep putting your left net anywhere else, nothing's ever going to work. It's all futility and frustration. Cast your net on the right side. The right side is where Jesus' right hand of favor is. And the waters flow out from under the altar there. They flow out from under because you have to humble yourself to drink this. 
The waters are not flowing nine feet high, so you have to jump up to get it or be lofty or high or be a giant, but they're flowing so any child, Reese, could get a drink of these waters. She could just bend down and it'd be easier for her than it would be for me because of size. And the more you see yourself in stature, sometimes the harder it is to bow down and take a drink of the water. They're flowing out from under the altar. But thank God for an altar where he bled and he died. Thank God for the side that was riveted. Thank God for the water that flows. There's water and there's no water flowing in this temple. Because the abundant source, the eternal river lives in this temple. Don't you know you're the temple tonight? He's talking about you. He's showing you a picture of the new covenant church here. Out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. He's showing you a picture of you. And so the death of Jesus, he took all my disfavor, all my discredit, all my disgrace, and I receive his life, strength, and healing. But then notice this. There must be and there has to be a deliverance from the north gate. He brought me out of the way of the north gate. Now the north is always the direction of judgment, darkness, and gloom. Always. Your directions are like this. Darkness in the north, judgment. East is always a day dawning. South is always discernment. When the south wind blows, everything gets warm and everything becomes fragrant. It's discernment represented in the nose. And the west is always the most holy place and represents destiny. So whenever you're reading the Old Covenant and he's talking about an army coming from the north, he's talking about judgment. If he's talking about a people coming out of the east, he's talking about a day dawning. If he's talking about people coming from the south, he's talking about the discernment of God coming so that there's a fragrance being released in the earth. And if he tells you of the west, the west speaks of destiny because God always set his throne up in the west in the most holy place. And when the natural sun went down, if you were looking west, all you could see was God on his throne. So these directions are very important. They tell us something. And preachers have been trained to stay in the north gate. There's a way of the north gate. Notice that. He brought me out of the way. When you, when you train there and you preach there and you live there and you think there, the only thing you can see is gloom and doom and darkness. That's all you can see. But you cannot create light by preaching darkness. You can never put out a fire by yelling fire. But the, the, the minds of men say, well, we warn people. Okay, I understand. The Bible does say we warn every man in Christ. I'll give you that one. That one I won't try to explain away because there is a warning in Christ. But you do not, you do not put out fire by crying fire. You call the fire department. You do something about it. You get water. And the antitype for darkness is light. And the antitype for gloom and despair is hope, which comes from the resurrection. So when you listen to preachers, and I listened to one man yesterday on television, I listened to him for about 20 minutes, and after I listened to him, I was overwhelmed with despair. He was talking about America being hopeless and helpless and America having no hope, and then I remember what God showed me about the flag. And I remember what God said to me about the flag. I walked by that flag one day and the Holy Ghost arrested me and made me take a good look at the flag and write that down. I remember God sees something different when he sees this nation. He does not see a people failing and faltering and dying. He sees a nation that he birthed and blessed. He sees a nation that he birthed and he blessed to take those four corners of that flag and envelop the earth with the gospel. That's why we're here. And those stripes on that flag and that red, white, and blue and those stars in the heavens all represent what he planned and what he prophesied. And that's what we need to agree with. And God is waiting on us to see what we're going to call America. Preachers in the North Gate are calling us dead. They're calling us hopeless. They're saying judgment is now coming. But God took me out of the North Gate. You need to be delivered from the North Gate. To be in the north gate means you see everything through the eyes of an old covenant judgment. You see everything through the eyes of the old covenant judgment. You can't see that the cross was the place where God finalized judgment. He put the judgment of the world on Christ and Christ was put to death in that judgment. He spared not his own son, Romans 8, 32. So we all need to be delivered from the north gate. You need to be brought out. And so thank God he brought me out of the north gate. Here's a Northgate preacher. I was looking at the church in 1994, and uh, this is what I preached at a big conference. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Show my people their sin. 
So I looked into the North Gate. I'd been trained in the North Gate. And I preached the sins of Pentecost were gluttony, gossip, grumbling, grudges, and greed. And I took those five sins and I took the face of the people and I rubbed their face in that for an hour and 15 minutes and I did it well. And they shouted me down. And the answer for gluttony is to fast. And the answer for grudges is to forgive. And the answer for greed is to freely give. Theologically, it was a good message. Preached the Bible that day, but that's a Northgate message. Now, if I would to God, I could have that moment back. I'll never get that back, but if I ever get that chance again, I believe I will. When I get the chance now, I'm going to take Isaiah 58 and lift up my voice like a trumpet, and I'm going to show you your sins. I'm going to show you your sins on an old rugged cross from a bleeding lamb where Jesus drank a cup in the Garden of Gethsemane and all of your sin and all the sins of America and all the sins of the world. And I'll go even further. Every homosexual sin and every abortion sin and everything that's ever been done, if he didn't bear it all, then we've all got reason for concern. But I believe Jesus, when I look at my sin now, I see my sin on an old rugged cross. I see the lamb bleeding. I see the lamb dying. And I see God being satisfied for his wrath was poured out on Jesus and God satisfied himself. God said, I do this for my own sake I brought out your sins for my own sake saith the Lord he delivered me from the north gate you need to be delivered from the north gate when you look in the north gate it's all gloom and doom and despair it's darkness it's hopeless and helpless so what did he do he brought me into the gate that looketh eastward now I'm looking in a new day and you know what I see now I see a people living in Romans 8 1 through 39 when I look into a new day, what I see a new day at open door. I'm going to preach tonight. It's a new day right now. It's a brand new day. If you're waiting on something else to happen, you, you're mistaken. It's a brand new day. I prophesy to you. It's a new day. God is here. You're filled with the Holy Ghost. You're washed in the blood. God's not imputing your sin. You have the authority of Jesus' name. You have his blood. You have his righteousness. You have the power of God in you. It's a brand new day right now. Right now. It's a brand new day. Right now. He delivered me from the way that looketh into the north gate. And then when the man started measuring, the house stood toward the east. This church is facing in the east. We've turned from the north and the south and the west. We're looking into the east. We're looking at the dawning of a new day. What's the day? The day star rising in your heart. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. I'm looking at the day when Christ rises in you. I'm looking at that, seeing that, and thus the man went into the new day. See, Jesus is measuring into this new day. Do you see it? The reason he uses a thousand, and I want you to notice this, with every increase, there's never a change of measurement. The thousand is the 10 by 10 by 10 cubicle called the most holy place. If you multiply 10 by 10, you get 100, and another 10, you get 1,000. The most holy place was a 1,000 square cubits, and that's what he's measuring, what's going on in the most holy place, which is Jesus has been enthroned and the blood's on the mercy seat. He's ministering a new covenant here, and he never changes his measurement. Aren't you glad tonight? There's never going to be another message. He spoke by his son. Aren't you glad there'll never be another drop of blood shed? That blood of Jesus is on the mercy seat. It is the blood of the everlasting covenant. It is final forever. It is finished. It is done. Jesus is Lord. He reigns forever. And thank God the measurement will never change. There'll never be another message. There'll never be need for another message. This gospel is all-encompassing, all-inclusive. You need the gospel of Jesus. It is the power of God unto salvation. So he measures the direction, then he measures the dimension of the most holy place. And he keeps going forth. And then I want you to notice this. He brings Ezekiel to development. Now here's something we've preached this, and I missed this before. But notice three times when you read your Bible, he brought me through the waters. He brought me through the waters. He brought me through the waters. This is Jesus taking you through the waters. So let's do it this way. The first time he takes you through the waters, he's establishing your walk. so that you can walk in these things so that you can walk in righteousness you can walk in provision you can walk in peace but he took Ezekiel through the waters Ezekiel had an experience with those waters 
those waters baptized his feet. He walked in those waters. And so it's not going to do me any good to stand here on the bank of the river and to preach this and prophesy it if I don't let him take me through the waters. He wants to take you through the waters till he puts some stuff in your feet. It's not how beautiful are the mouth, the head, or the hands of them on the mountain. It's how beautiful are the feet of him and the feet of them on the mountain. God is concerned about what you're walking in. It's the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I want to walk in the supernatural. I want to walk in the spirit. I want to walk in holiness. I want to walk in peace. I want to walk in salvation. I want to walk in strength. I want to walk in Christ. It's what you walk in. An experience that establishes your walk. His feet were nailed to that tree and bled to end your walk, but also to, to pay the price of blood for everything you'd ever walk in. In the name of Jesus. And then he measured again. And once the people walk in something, then to the knees, to me, that speaks of bowing your knees in worship. It says lift holy hands and say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I worship you. Jesus, I would rather worship you than preach. I would rather worship you than anything I know. I would rather worship you than do anything else. Jesus, I worship you. I want an experience in worship. And you're never going to have that if you don't worship. I love to remind myself, especially when I'm alone and no one's around, in here or in the car, wherever I am. Jesus, I worship you. And Lord, it's not because I have to. There's no one around to see. There's no one around to, it's not because I have to, Lord, I want to. I choose to worship you. I want an experience in worship. You know, you can encounter God in worship in ways you can encounter him nowhere else. You can worship him. His presence comes. There's something about worship that draws his very heart. And Gideon said to the angel, he said, before you go, let me worship. Gideon said, before you go, let me worship. Jesus said, the Father seeketh such to worship him. So Ezekiel got his knees wet. Got his knees wet. You bend your knee and you worship Jesus. You bend your knee and praise God and just say, Father, I thank you. Lord, I thank you. I praise you. I bless you, Jesus. It's not hard. One hand without wrath, one hand without doubting. Thank you, Jesus. Not hard. Then to the loins. He had an experience here. And the loins always represent that which is reproduced. And Jesus said this in Matthew 19. Jesus said, now, some men were born eunuchs. Then Jesus said, some men were made eunuchs by kings because in the old covenant times, when they had men, they would take captives and slaves. They would castrate them, make them eunuchs because then they, could, they wouldn't defile holy things. It would just end that problem and they would castrate the slaves. They did that all the time. It was a common practice. Some men are made eunuchs by kings, but then Jesus said some make themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of God. Now, how do you do that? It's easy. Number one, you put on the belt of truth. Where's the belt go? It's a loin belt. You put on the belt of truth. When you take on the truth, that ends you producing you. If you have, you know, we used to have some really dumb teachings. Do you remember some of these? I used, to, I used to teach this and other people taught it to me. Now, every night when you go to bed, you take your armor off and then every morning when you get up, you have to put it on. You remember that? You know, I found out a whole lot better just to leave it on. Don't you ever take your armor off, put on righteousness and wear it. Put on the shoes and just wear them to bed and wear them when you get up. If you get up and go to the restroom in the middle of the night, go in there, walk in there in the shoes of the gospel of peace, have your loins girded about with truth, have your helmet on. Don't ever take your clothes off before the Lord. Don't do that. Always time trying to put the armor back on. No, 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 no. And then number two, you just step in the river. If you'll come into the river up to your waist, that means truth and spirit, word and spirit. Through the word and spirit, I can't produce anymore because if you get in the word through the spirit, you can't produce your own image anymore. Jesus said, give me the coin. And he said, whose inscription's on the coin? And they said, Caesar's. He handed it back and said, give Caesar what belongs to Caesar. Let me ask you, Michael Mobley, whose inscription's in you? He put his image in you. So render to God what is his. You're in his image. He put his image in you. When he looks at you, he sees himself. That belongs to him. That's his, not yours. It's his. And he's not producing you. He's producing himself through you. You're valuable. You're necessary. You're needed. But he's producing himself through you. And then... He had an experience. He'd walked in something. 
He'd worshiped in something. He'd witnessed and shared it with others. It's threefold cord. Then, when he measured the fourth time, this fourth dimension, the waters rose till the wisdom of God came, and now we got something that cannot be passed over. Man, just think. We have such a message here that it just can't be passed over. People can't ignore us. We have such a prayer ministry here, people can't ignore our prayer. If they need prayer, they know where to call. We have such an abundance here, people can't ignore us anymore. Somebody with cancer or AIDS, they can't ignore us anymore because they know this is where you find the answer is in that river. It's in that river. It's in that river. It is in that river where the river flows. He prophesies here that everything these waters touch is going to be healed. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. It's by the Holy Ghost. And when the Holy Ghost flows in that dimension, anything's possible. The supernatural is the ordinary to us. It becomes the way we live. It's a river that can't be passed over. And see, that's what Romans 8's all about is the Holy Ghost praying in you. With groanings which cannot be uttered, always transitioning you. Something to walk in. You're walking in something. You pray, now you're walking in something. You pray, and now you're worshiping in something. You pray, and, and now you've got a witness and a testimony. People see a change in you, and then you keep praying in the Spirit, and this river just keeps increasing until it's the wisdom of God that cannot be passed over. When the world got in trouble in the book of Genesis, who'd they turn to? Joseph. A boy with a covenant. When the world got in trouble in the book of Daniel, who did they turn to? They turned to Daniel, man of God. Now, in those empires of old, they turned to two Jewish young men and they brought deliverance to the world. You and I have a far greater revelation than Joseph or Daniel ever had. We have Jesus in us. Amen. Praise God. And what you get is a, an experience here. You, you understand this transition and then he brings you back to the brink of the river so that you can make your choices. Now, do you want to walk in something? Do you want to worship? Do you want to cut your witness off and let it be his and not yours? He'll give you the choice. So he took Ezekiel back to the river and said, now you choose. I set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Choose life and you and your seed may live. That's what that is. He brings you back to a choice. Now, I'm going to close with this tonight because we've gone long enough. But look at Ezekiel 47, 8 and 9. Let's read it one more time off the board. He said to me, these waters issue toward the east country. So the east is a new day. These waters are flowing toward a new day. And go down. Notice these waters are in a high place and they go down to the desert. The desert, I looked it up today. It literally means the place of depression the place of oppression, the place of carnality, the place in the earth and into the sea, the wicked are like a troubled sea. So he's telling you that these waters are going into the wicked places and they're going to those that are depressed and wounded, to the blind, the beggar, the broken, the bound and the bruised. That's where these waters are going. What did he say? I pour out my spirit upon all flesh depressed flesh and dark flesh and disobedient flesh and, and dead flesh. He's going to pour out his spirit. How's he going to do that? The river's going to flow out of you and me. See it? And the waters shall be healed. Not might be, but they shall be healed. So what's flowing out of us will begin to restore and bless and help creation find its healing. Look at verse 9. And it shall come to pass that everything that lives has one kind of life and moves. And the earth is movement, full of movement tonight. What, wheresoever the river shall come shall live with God's life and there shall be a great multitude of fish. Great harvest comes. These waters shall come for they shall be healed and everything that shall live where the river comes. So God's telling you here that what's flowing out of the church is going to bring life to a hurting, broken, dying creation. And it all comes through transition. And part of that is learning to operate in Romans chapter 8, how we learn to move with the Spirit from not knowing to knowing. In Jesus' name, let's stand together. There's a whole lot more in that than what I was able to give you tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.
to give you this testimony. It's for you, Mr. George. I want to do this for you, get you some help tonight before we leave. 2010, before I knew you, I was under a great trial of affliction in my life personally. And one, one of the things I did, I fasted. I went quite a few days without food during that time. And uh, I didn't drink enough water and I got myself extremely dehydrated and I, had, I got gout in my body. I didn't know what gout was. I knew my grandmother had suffered for it, but I got gout in my body. And gout does not only affect the joints in the big toe, but most people don't know this, but gout is, I think it's acid that crystallizes in your body, in the joints, and you can get it in any joint in your body. You can get it in any joint in your body. I had gout, this is the truth. I had gout in September of 2010. I had gout in both big toes and both ankles. My ankles both swelled up softball size. I had it in both knees, especially behind the knees. I had it in my right elbow, bad pocket of it, my right elbow, couldn't bend my arm straight about as far as it would go, and both thumbs, right in the thumb joints. And I went to the doctor and they told me what it was and I said, man, I, you know, it's, it's just a form of arthritis is what it is. And so I started drinking water, believing God, but I was preaching at Pastor Sears on September 12th, Sunday night, 2010, about 7.15 in the afternoon. And he's got a high platform and I came off the platform, I was standing right here in the middle of his church and I was preaching on the name of Jesus, the glory and the power of the name. And when I said, in the name of Jesus, and I had gout in my body, I mean, I, it was everything I could do. I had to walk up seven steps to get up there, but I did it. Then I had to walk seven steps down to get down there to preach. All I could do, I mean, it's all I could do. I, you know, probably look like somebody about 95 years old coming down those steps, but I did it. But when I said, in the name of Jesus, disease, leave this building, leave our body, every bit of gout in my body left supernaturally. My socks slid down, my toes went right, my thumbs went free, my elbow popped, and my knees were set free, and I hadn't had a symptom of gout since September 12, 2010. So that's been six long years. Now, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we lay our hands on you tonight in Jesus' name and decree gout leave his body now. Gout, we speak to you in the name of Jesus. This testimony has now released the power to remove gout. This acid that's crystallized in his joints is now broken up. And in the name of Jesus, he has peace, he has relief. And I call George healed in your name, Jesus. Gout, go in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. And as gout left me and has not been back, so gout leaves George tonight and he will not have it again in the name of Jesus. Not one feeble one among our tribes. We sang healing tonight. We preach healing. We prophesy healing tonight in the name of Jesus. And we call this servant of God, we call this son of God healed in his body by whose stripes you're healed. And I prophesy his healing and gout is broken up and out of his body in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. And Father, I'm not believing he's healed. I receive he's healed. I receive he's healed. Whatsoever thing you desire, when you pray, believe you receive them, you shall have them. I receive him healed in Jesus' name. And this man of God is healed. This servant of the Lord is healed. And I thank you. Gout cannot stay in his body. Gout. The serpent is under his feet. It's under our feet together. And Lord, let that tell you. If you've got any kind of arthritis... Don't have to be gout in the name of Jesus. You receive your healing right now. In the name of Jesus, receive your healing. Move your, move your hands, move your, move your feet, whatever, wherever the problem was, start moving it, saying in Jesus' name, I receive my healing, I receive my healing. Arthritis, go in the name of Jesus. Arthritis, go in the name of Jesus. Arthritis, go in the name of Jesus. And God is my witness that night. I walked out of there with tears running down my face. The problem was still there. The adversity was still there. But thank God, the affliction of my body had completely been removed that quick. Gout left my body. Hadn't had a trace of it since then. In the name of Jesus, arthritis, leave. In the name of Jesus, blood pressure, come down. In the name of Jesus, these rivers make us live. Get in the river. Just get in the, get quickened by the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Man, there's power in this room right now. There's glory in this room in the name of Jesus. You that are watching by internet in the name of Jesus, receive your healing. You lift your hands right where you are and receive your healing in the name of Jesus. 
you got any kind of arthritis or bursitis or any kind of gout in the name of Jesus you are healed the authority of that name in the name of the son of God his name is Jesus no other name given no other name honored Jesus name Jesus name Come on, get in the Holy Ghost for a few moments. Get in the Spirit. Thank you, In the name of Jesus. Come on, move something you couldn't move before. Check it out. God's healing powers in the room. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed in Jesus' name. Be healed. Stiff knees are healed in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Digestive issues are healed in Jesus' name. Digestive issues are healed in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. 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 Let the glory of the Lord, let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Lord, fill your temple with glory. Lord, flow out of your temple in glory. Lord, fill your temple with glory tonight. In the name of Jesus, flow out of your temple in glory. Glory, glory, glory. Doxa, manifested presence. In Jesus' name. Now I prophesy over you that you're walking in some things. You're walking in some stuff you ain't walked in before. You're bowing your knee at home to worship in some things you've never worshiped in. There's a witness coming through you that people have never heard in this area before. Your loins are covered with the belt of truth and the word of the Lord and the river of the Spirit in Jesus' name. God's making you wisdom that can't be passed by. He's making your voice to be heard, your light to be seen, your salt to be tasted. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, while we're in atmosphere, lay hands on my mother in Jesus' name. Now, I just prophesied to my mother, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Lord, her body strengthened. 83 years old, but she's strengthened tonight. By the power of the anointing, Caleb was 85, she's only 83. Lord, right now, I just agree with her that she's healed in Jesus' name. She's strengthened, stable on her feet, strong in her mind, blessed in her body, and will live her days in strength and peace in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Everybody get what you need. Whatever you need, get it tonight. Get what you need. Get it, get it, get it while it's here. Get what you need in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Astounding glory. Astounding glory. Jesus, be glorified. Jesus. I worship you, Jesus, for healing tonight. I worship you, Jesus. I praise you in advance. Lord, I praise you and thank you that George is healed. I praise you. Miss Rosie's healed. I praise you. My mother's healed. I praise you, Lord, that we are walking in strength. And Lord, we make a decision at the brink of the river. Lord, I pray, take me through the waters. 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 That these things aren't just doctrine to me or theory or thought or theology, but they're an experience. I've lived it. I've lived it. I've lived it. In Jesus' name. That's it, Michael. New day. It's here. New day right now. New day. New day. We ain't waiting for another day. It's today. Today. While it is called today. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. I just feel like shouting, hallelujah, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus, for revival that's breaking out an open door. Praise you, Jesus. All of heaven's breaking loose an open door. All of the anointing and the abundance and that thing we've been preaching, the dam, I hear the Spirit of God saying, the dam is broken and it's flooding, it's flooding. Flood tides of blessing, flood tides of healing, flood tides of anointing, flood tides of favor are coming forth from my spirit, saith the Lord. Flood tides of my favor coming forth, saith the Lord Almighty. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. Yes. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And Father, we'll give you all the glory and praise. We'll give you all the honor. And we thank you. Something radical, something supernatural has been released into this atmosphere. Lord, our Sunday service this week can't be like it's been. It's going to be radically different, Lord. Lord, my life's radically changed till I walk out and here Sunday. It's radically different, Lord. You're doing supernatural things. And oh, God, bring me through the waters. I mean, make it your earnest prayer. Lord, bring me through the waters. And in Jesus' name, we all said together, amen. Amen and amen and amen. Come on, praise God and give him a shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.